Hello. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to turn this on. Good morning. Whoa. God's light is really shining on me today. Hallelujah. How's everyone doing? Ones that I can see at least. Amen. Um, yeah, that video for those that don't first time here or haven't been here lately, uh, we're doing a theme through the book of Romans. And um, it's a travel with our faith, you know. And um, this is actually an awesome book to read. And, the, and I've read it plenty of times. But now that I know that I have to speak about it, uh, I've been doing some, uh, some extra studying in it. And I'm finding all of this, like, hidden messages. And so just like in the movies where you, you find hidden messages and, and stuff like that, um, uh, it's just amazing, God's word. And um, so I hope you have as fun listening to me as I have fun sharing. So I'm going to start off with a phrase, and this phrase is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Like, I think I'm really good looking. But that could be my eyes looking only at me, and, you know, someone else might think differently. I don't know. Um, when, when you think of the word beauty, what comes first to your mind? Anyone could pop out with some different things. When you think... Huh? Beauty and the Beast. There we go. She thinks beasts are beautiful. That's why she married me. <laughs> Anyone else? Guys, come on. When you think beauty, don't worry. I won't think that you're feminine. When you think the word beauty, what, what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I hope you say Lucas, your baby. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, Sorry. <laughs> Okay, you have two things to choose from. <laughs> uh, I won't say what I think is beauty because, you know, my wife, obviously, right? I get to sleep with you tonight. Yes, no matter on the couch, yes. Um, the title of my speech is called uh, Beauty in Slavery. And that's a weird combination. Now, can we even combine those two words together, beauty and slavery, especially with what's going on today with human trafficking and, uh, and bringing different people into slavery for different reasons. Uh, we're fighting against this stuff. We're fighting against slavery. Um, but the slavery that I want to talk about is, is a totally different definition and, and uh, how we can talk about the beauty of this slavery. The first, uh, we're in chapter 6 right now, and our pastor Ike talked about the first part of chapter 6, about uh, freedom from sin, um, and how sin no, no longer has a power over us um, and how we're actually free to disobey our sinful nature. Isn't that kind of cool? We're free to disobey our sinful nature. It's kind of like a twist. I like it. Anyways. And then in the second half of chapter 6, what I'm going to talk about, it's more about the, the, the beauty of, of, this, of this freedom. And, and, and what does this beauty look like? Um, so I think, yes... Slavery can be a good thing when it's slavery to God. And I'll get more deep into this as we go along. But the burden of the passing pleasures of sin can never compare with the freedom that we find uh, as Christians when we experience slavery to God. So you can have your definition of what slavery is in your head and keep that. And I'll even share a, a modern day definition of what slavery is later on. But, but you can keep your definition of that. That's okay. Because that's your opinion. Yeah? So I'm going to read the part that I'm going to talk about. Um, Romans 6, 15 to, 20, to 23. I didn't put it on there because it's a lot of scripture. But it's actually very good. I'm going to read from the New American Standard Bible. And if any of you have a problem understanding American, then you can raise your hand and our pastor will translate for you. Just in case. But I think everyone can understand. All the heresy, All the heresy I'm about to share right now. Yeah. All right, you guys ready? What then shall we, uh, shall, we, uh, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you, that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. 
And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Whoa. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further, further lawlessness, so now present your members, which is you, uh, as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. These are some heavy words, and I'll explain what these words mean as we go along. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefits were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed of? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your new benefit resulting in sanctification. There's that big word again. And the outcome of it is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So when you read this, it actually pulls out like uh, certain qualities of this beauty of slavery um, to God. Okay? And the first one, which, which uh, Pastor Ike shared about last, uh, last Sunday, was in the beginning, uh, the first verse in chapter 6. And he said, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? And then the one I shared, I just read right now, which is in verse 15. And it says that, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? These questions uh, bring a challenging thought to our, our way of thinking and way of understanding of what salvation is. Uh, I hope we know what salvation is because it's, it's the reason why we're sitting here. You know, salvation is, is, uh, is something that we receive by grace, by God's mercy, and we can't do anything to work for it. That's the basic things of it. But I want to focus on the second one that I talked about, uh, which is, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What does that, what does that mean? When we were slaves to sin, uh, that was our master. And so we did what the sin told us to do. Uh, but now, if we choose to be, uh, have God as our master, uh, we're not forced to do what he wants, but we get to choose to do what he wants for us. So to understand this beauty, we have to ask a few questions. And the first one, I have two questions. The first one is, what is the reality of our lives? Um, whether you want to agree with me or not, uh, you are going to be, uh, you have to serve somebody. You're either going to be a slave to sin and to, and to that way of living, or you're going to serve or be a slave to God and his way of living. Whether you like it or not, you have to make a choice. And uh, I know that the scriptures say that there's freedom in Christ, but freedom in Christ means that we, we are choosing to be a slave to God. Making sense? Tongue twisters here? It's, it's pretty heavy when I was reading all this. I have some like little things here. It says, either we are a slave of sin, which is resulting in death, or we are a slave to obedience, which is resulting in righteousness. Righteousness being made right. See, the new believer has the choice of serving sin or serving righteousness. Salvation brings freedom from the bondage, which is being handcuffed to sin, and allows the believer to choose another master. I choose God. And this is why. Either, either you're going to serve sin. And this is what serving sin brings. You might think I'm a little bit emo or melancholy. But, but, but this is actually what sin brings if you decide to serve sin. It brings broken fellowship. It brings shattered dreams. Ruined health. Painful relationships. Legal problems. Believe me, I know. Uh, yeah, and, and having sin as a master... Unfortunately, it means death. But then if you decide to serve obedience, and I'll explain what type of obedience I'm talking about, but the obedience that I'm talking about, it brings a form of purity. It brings freedom, and it brings what real fulfillment is all about. Having obedience as a master means sanctification. What's sanctification? That's a heavy word right there, and I'll explain it in just a bit. But in essence, sanctification means peace and joy and, and uh, growth spiritually. A new believer is free to serve the one who makes his life worth living. And to me, that's, that's God. He makes my life worth living, and he brings me peace, and he brings me joy. And, and uh, whether you want to believe it or not, I remember I was teaching 
uh, a gymnasium class. It was Santa's class uh, on the Faroe Islands, and they wanted me to talk about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And then I asked them first, hey, do you guys believe in ghosts and the spiritual world and stuff like that in there? And only half of them raised their hand, and I'm like, well, sorry to say, but if you don't believe in spirits and stuff like that, you're a bit ignorant. And they're like, why are we ignorant? But then I explained why, and that's a whole other preach. But there is a spiritual world out there, and I tried to have spiritual growth in so many other different areas of my life, and, and uh, I kept on hitting walls. I kept on allowing different things to come into my life that just screwed me up. But when I allowed God to come into my life in His Spirit, that spiritual growth brought fulfillment that I'm still enjoying to this day. So the second question, the first one is, what is the reality of our lives? The reality is that we serve one side or the other. And then the second one is, is what are the consequences of our choices? Um, consequences, just in case you didn't know, I'm a bit dumb, so I had to look it up. Consequences are not necessarily bad. It's just the outcome of your choices. Yeah? So the consequences... What are the consequences of our choices? I believe that the believer must make a choice between shame and death on this side or righteousness and sanctification on this side. The consequences of our choices will either be the wages, which is the wages of sin, which is death, or the gift of God, which is eternal life. And uh, then you're thinking, oh man, man is talking about all these things that we're doing bad. You know, and, and that's going to bring death. But you know what else brings starvation to our life? Is trying to be good. <laughs> trying to follow all the laws and all the rules. Trying to, trying to like prove your worth in life. And that just, that brings some sort of dryness to your life. At least it did to me when you're just trying to, to like, uh, like you're walking on eggshells. Following all the laws and the rules and making sure that you're doing everything right. And, and, and it, there's nothing in that. There's nothing in following in the law. It just, it, um, it, to me, it doesn't bring any fulfillment. What brings me fulfillment is identifying, it, identifying myself in, in the death and resurrection of Jesus and, and what he did for us. Um, and to know that, hey, our sins are forgiven. We don't have to walk on eggshells trying to like, know, do everything that's right in the day. Yeah, the first five chapters of Romans basically talk about that salvation is by grace through faith. Chapter six is a new introdu introduction. I talked about having freedom from sin, and then I'm talking about uh, the beauty of, of, of slavery in God and the whole idea of, of sanctification. I have these little questions for you just to think about. See, so the new believer in Christ is saved from sin by grace through faith, but how is he sanctified? I keep on saying this word purposely. How is he made like Jesus Christ? How are we made like Jesus Christ? You hear about that all the time, that we want to be like Jesus Christ, but how can we be made like Jesus Christ? And what does it mean by which he actually become, how, how do, what does it mean that we're actually becoming a better person? And is the believer, someone that believes in Jesus, Saved by grace, and then this sanctified word, is it, do we receive that by the things that we do? Is it by works? And what is the believer's role in the process of this change in our life, this, this transformation? Okay, so here's the big question. What is sanctification? Uh, Romans 6.19 says that, So now present your members, which is, which is yourselves, as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Sanctification, basically, the simplicity of it is that we are um, becoming more like Jesus Christ. And if you read about who Jesus is, then you know what type of person he was and, and his characteristic. Um, but I want to talk about that there's two different types of this being like Jesus. There's the, and this is like teaching stuff that I'm giving you right now. But um, there's the positional sanctification. And if, it, if positional means that you're standing right here, and you're not moving, that means that, that uh, positional sanctification is the minute that you start believing in Jesus Christ and what he did for your lives, bam, you become like Jesus. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your sinful nature. He sees Jesus in you. 
And so therefore, you're made perfect, you're made holy, you're made clean, period. That's right when you start believing. That's what personal sanctification means. Sanctification, holiness, sanctification, being like Jesus. Then you got this journey. And that's why we're going through the book of Romans, because it's a journey. And you got this progressional. Progressional means you're getting there little by little by little. And this is progressional sanctification. And it means that we're growing into the fullness of what sanctification means. Being like Jesus, 100%. So what does sanctification look like in our lives? I believe that sanctification means that a believer is less characterized by the sin that's in him and more characterized by the spirit that is in him. I believe that sanctification looks like you are less characterized by the sinner and more characterized by Jesus. I believe a person that is sanctified is more aware is more aware of his unworthiness in the flesh before a holy God. But then he's also more confident and that he's accepted in Christ because he has the Holy Spirit in him. You see, dealing with, with this journey through sanctification is one of the hardest things that we can go through. And we can get so frustrated with ourselves because we, don't, we think we're not there yet. We haven't arrived yet. Of course we haven't. We won't arrive there until Jesus comes again and gives us these perfect bodies. And I'm really looking forward to that because I would like to look, you know, I like this. Yeah, I, I look good right now, I know, but I would like, you know, a better body, okay? Period. And, and so I'm looking forward to that. But it can be so frustrating the way I look at myself now and the way that I'm living my life now. And, I, and I'm trying to become more like Jesus every single day of my life. And I keep on tripping over my small feet. And I'm just like, oh. But then I realize, wait a minute. There's a beauty in this sanctification. And that's called the positional sanctification. Because, wait a minute. Even though I'm growing into being holy and perfect and like Jesus, I'm already holy and perfect like Jesus in God's eyes right now. See, but God, you know, he, he, he's omnipresent. He's all-knowing, all, all omniscient, whatever. You know, the three omnis. He's all-knowing. He's, he's all-present. And, and he, he's everywhere, okay? And so he's not bound to time, you know? And so when he looks at us, he's not looking at us in the time that we're having growing into this holy life. He's looking at us without time involved, saying, wow, there's my perfect son or daughter that I created. Isn't, 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 isn't he or she beautiful? Wow. You know, and then that becomes a blessing. And that shows what true beauty is. I got this video to give you a little visual of what uh, I can best explain sanctification to be like. The journey, that is. So you can play it right now if you want. You see, like the beginning of, the, of this tree's life, it obviously started as a seed. But that seed, it had everything that it needed to be a tree. All it had to do was grow into that tree. And uh, trees can live a lot longer than most humans. So that was like, you know, a, couple, you know, a little over 100 years, which we don't live that long anymore. Um, but when we start having faith in who we are in Christ, we automatically have all of that sanctification, that holiness, that Christ characteristic in us. And all we have to do is grow into it. So when we allow ourselves to be enslaved by God, then we get all of this, all of these characteristics of Jesus in us. And, 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 and all we have to do is grow into the fullness of it. And then, and then you start seeing the, the beauty develop. When you see a, a, a tree first coming out, it's just a a, a trunk, a small stem, and then a leaf. And then you start seeing more fullness and more life, and it gets bigger. And, and, then, and then it starts uh, uh, having life, you know, in the tree. You know, birds are, are nesting, and, and animals are resting underneath the shadow of it. And you just, it brings life. I mean, without trees, we wouldn't be able to breathe, for goodness sakes. I mean, so it's just such beauty when you see something like that grow. But look at ourselves like that. Why can't we look at ourselves and see the beauty that God sees in us? 
Why do we always have to, yeah, we know the cliches, you know, we're forgiven. Yeah, we know that, we're, that, that we're, in God's eyes we're made holy. But do we really live in that? Do we really actually believe in the faith that we have and who we are in Christ? I don't know about you, but I have some days when I look in the mirror and I don't believe it. It's just the way it is. But you know, we got to keep on, I don't know, slapping ourselves in the face and saying, no, I am holy. I am a, a, a reflection of what Jesus Christ is. And when God, the, the creator of the flipping universe looks at me, he's like, wow, now that's beauty. You know? And so I know this is a bit American, but it, hey, guess what? I'm American. So I'm allowed to do this, right? And so when I was, and, and I didn't find this uh, on the, uh, I didn't Google this, or, and it actually just came to me. This, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and so when I was thinking, you know, um, beauty in, in, in slavery, and then I was looking at the word beauty, and uh, then I, I broke it apart and I looked, oh, what can the B stand for? And what can the E and the A and the U and the T and the Y for beauty? And this is what I came up with. Beauty. The B is for belonging. The E is for engaging. The A is for... No, I won't sing. And the A is for attitude. And, and the U is for unifying. And the T is for testifying. And the, e is for, the, e, <laughs> the Y is for yielding. And um, I'll explain why. Because for me, when I look at these, these help me remember and, and help me on my journey uh, of this progressive sanctification. The first thing that, I, for me, you know, is, is uh, who do I belong to? Knowing who you belong to. Uh, 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Because of our faith and our decision to let, let God's Spirit be in us, we automatically become children of God. And all we have to do is believe in that. And know that we belong to the awesomest family that ever existed. Right? Then we got engaging. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, except for me. Uh, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If you truly believe that you're a child of God then engage in it. Live it out. And live it out through what you talk about, how you talk about yourself, how you talk about God, how you talk about others. Live it out the way you conduct your life. Live it out most of all through love, in faith, and in purity. And the purity is our walk through this life, this, this, this uh, progressive sanctification life. Amen? Then you got, you, when you're actually engaging this, there's something that you, it just happens whether you like it or not. Your attitude starts to change. Whether you like it or not, I don't care. Your attitude, if you're actually believing that you're a child of God and you're actually engaging this mentality, your attitude is going to change. And your attitude is going to change is going to be the attitude of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.5 says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being and very nature, God, do not consider equality to God something to grasp or hold on to, but he let it all go and came down here to earth to serve us. Serve us to the point to, to death and death on the cross. That's what it says. And that's going to be our attitude, whether we like it or not, when we're actually engaging that we believe that we're children of God. Then you can't do this alone. There's no low rangers. In fact, I don't know if you guys even know who Lone, the Lone Ranger is. It's an, an American story of this cowboy dude that wore a mask and he saved the day all the time. And it was like he was saving the day by himself, but he actually had a partner in crime. It was an Indian dude. Indians get no respect in America. But he had an Indian partner that actually, his name was Tonto. Hopefully he was an Apache because that's where I come from. And, and he helped Lone Rangers. So there is no Lone Rangers. When you're living this life across Christ, and when you say that you're, you're part of God's family, you're not an only son. You know, there's loads of other brothers and sisters that you're, that you're walking with. And so we need to unify together to, 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 to walk this walk of progressive sanctification 
Because we need each other to grow together, to be more like Christ together. Ephesians 4, 1 through 5 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul talking, he was a prisoner in jail and he's saying this, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. And when you were called, you were called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Unification. We need to unify together, unite together, so that we can take this journey together. You cannot do it alone. And if you don't like what we're doing here, then find another place. But find something to be a part of. Find a group, a fellowship that loves the same God that you love so that you can lift each other up, carry each other. So you could. And then the T. I actually wrote wrong. It's not, it's not testifying. It's actually tithing. T for tithing. If you don't pay your tithes, you won't be uh, holy. Amen? Hallelujah? Ouch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never mind. I'll just stick to my original word. <laughs> testifying. Uh, this is Paul writing again. And he says in Acts 20, 24, he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. And what is this task? It's the task of testifying of the gospel of God's grace. This is what the book of Romans is talking about. The, the, the gospel of grace. What is God's grace? It's God's mercy. What is mercy? It's grace in action. Amen. <laughs> it's a tongue twister right there, but it's true. God's grace. What can you share a story of God's grace and action in your life to someone else that asks you about it? Why do you serve this God? Why do you try to be so much like this guy, Jesus? Well, let me tell you. And then you tell him a, a testimony of what God has done in your life, how he's shown grace and mercy on your life. Can you do that? Do you want to do that? I don't know about you, but I want to do that because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> it's a song. It, it's true. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of my God because he's not ashamed of me. And so I want to testify about that. And this actually makes us more confident in who we are in Christ Jesus on that journey. Finally, yielding. Yielding is a very biblical word, but it just means produce. Proverbs eight nineteen, and I could have used loads of verses to uh, define yielding, but I use this one. It says, my fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. When you are living this life of progressive sanctification, when you are living this life where you're learning to be more like Christ Jesus, you will naturally produce fruit. What's, this, what's, the, what's the fruit of the Spirit? This is the fruit I'm talking about. The fruit of the Spirit. You will naturally produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You will naturally produce all of these in your life, in this, in this life uh, of being more like Jesus, because it's just the way it is. That's, that's, just, that's just how awesome our God is. And that's what he'll do through us. He'll produce all of these things. So I know it's a bit American, but, but to memorize these if you want, the beauty uh, phrase, it, it helps me. And uh, even though I just thought of it the other day, um, but I, I've actually been doing a lot of these already and I didn't even know it, amen? So, yeah. Slavery to God is, is true beauty, you all. Uh, even for us manly men. We've got to have this beauty in our lives, right? Okay? It's true freedom. So, so I, I told you what in the beginning... What, your, uh, what do you think is, what does slavery mean to you? And, um, and especially because of the days and age, the, the, day, the days now and, and what slavery is in our mentality and what's going on in this world. But then I looked up slavery and what it means today, the, the, the definition of it. And this is what it means. It means a, a relationship, a civil, civilized relationship in which one person has absolute power over the life fortune, and liberty of another. So slavery is basically allowing somebody to have absolute power over your life, over your fortune, which is your finances, your economy, 
over your freedoms, liberty, which is freedoms. That's what slavery is. I want God to have power over all those different areas of my life. The choice is yours. Shall we pray? Jesus, this is a tough subject. Tough subject you gave me to share with uh, my friends and my family here. But uh, it's such an important uh, subject to know who we are when you look at us. That when you look at us, you see true beauty. And, and, and Lord, I, I pray that you will give us the tools, the tools that I shared and maybe other tools to, to walk this walk to be more like your son, Jesus Christ. And not to walk alone, but to walk together and help each other through this, through this journey, through this journey of faith. We love you, Lord. And, and, and I don't ever want to turn back from this journey with you. And I pray that you will strengthen Everyone here that has heard this message, strengthen them to continue, to continue on this journey, to finish the journey. And instead of receiving the wages of sin, which is death, receiving the gift that you offer, which is eternal life with you. In Jesus' name we pray.